Hello, listeners. How are you? Welcome back to the podcast. The title of this episode is P35 Storytime, Learn English with Stories, brackets, LEP Premium, sample, close brackets, number one, The Bear Story. It's a ridiculously long title. I will explain it in a moment. There's a PDF for this, which is a full transcript. Check the episode description in your podcast player, click the link, and you can open it and read along with me or just read it later. Also, there's a video version with text on the screen so you can follow along with me while I read. I'll try not to go too quickly so you can keep up. This could be a long episode. You've heard me say that before. This could be a long episode. It might be worth watching or listening to this in several sessions. Or just see if you can stick with me for the whole thing. So, the title again. P35 Storytime, colon, Learn English with Stories, open brackets, LEP premium sample, close brackets. Number one, the bear story. So, let me explain this. When episodes have a P at the start, it actually means that they are premium episodes. So this is a premium episode, but this time I'm uploading it as a free episode for everybody. The idea is that with this episode I'm giving you a sample of what happens in episodes of Luke's English Podcast Premium, just to give you a flavour of LEP Premium, maybe to entice you to sign up just a little bit. I want to take this opportunity, actually, to say that LEP Premium is now available on Acast Plus, which means that you can get my premium episodes in any normal podcast app. It's available now. You probably heard me mention this change in episode 776. I told you to wait before signing up to LEP Premium. Well, now you can do it. All the premium episodes are there, they're ready, and you can sign up now and get started if you want. It's open now. Did you get the message, everyone? It's open now. Just click the link in the description where it says sign up to LEP Premium here. Just click that link or just go to teacherluke.co.uk slash premium to get started. And if you want more information about all of this, just go to teacherluke.co.uk slash premium info. That's where you get all of the information about the premium subscription, including the incredibly reasonable pricing, how to get the premium videos, premium PDFs with transcripts and worksheets, what usually happens in episodes of Luke's English Podcast Premium, and more information. teacherluke.co.uk slash premium info. Most of the premium episodes are vocabulary reviews focusing on language which has come up naturally in episodes of the free podcast. Usually I pick out target language from an episode, for example a conversation with my dad, and then I focus on reminding you of speci- <laughs> reminding you of specific phrases you heard but might not have fully understood, uh, f- fully noticed or understood. I use my particular set of teaching skills, because I have a particular set of skills. I use my particular set of teaching skills to help you understand and remember those bits of language while also expanding things and showing you all sorts of other related vocabulary like synonyms and collocations. And then I test your memory and use of that language and finally I give you a chance to practice pronouncing the language by repeating after me. So that's what you usually get in episodes of Luke's English Podcast Premium. And I've done a lot of episodes like that so far. There are currently about 150 episodes of the premium uh, subscription with transcripts and worksheets and everything. But with this episode, I'm giving you a free preview of a slightly different series which I'm going to publish in the premium subscription over the next few months. So this is just a little taste of what's coming to LEP Premium. Now, this isn't just an advert, an advertisement for the premium subscription. I mean, it is a little bit, but I'm also going to tell you a story. I'm going to teach you some language from the story, and also I'm going to demonstrate a learning method which you can use to improve your English by yourself, okay? So, story time. The series I'm talking about is called Story Time. That's what I've decided to call it. If you're a premium subscriber, 
You'll have heard me mention this lots of times. I've been talking about doing it for ages, for like several years. Like, oh, story, I've been working on story time episodes. Well, here it is finally. Storytime is a collection of short stories with accompanying PDFs which I will use to help you improve your English in various ways. I'll demonstrate it here in this episode. So this episode is going to include some details of my storytelling technique which is a method of improving your English with stories, uh, a story told by me about a bear, a time when I had an encounter with a bear, if you don't understand what that means, I'll explain it. So a story told by, by me with a full transcript available. And again, check the links in the description to download the PDFs. You don't need to give your email address or anything. You can just get the PDF straight away. None of that email stuff. Um, then uh, language exercises focusing on grammar, vocabulary and prepositions in the story. That will be included. And there will be some listen and repeat pronunciation drills to practice actually saying the lines from the story just like me. So you can work on your pronunciation and accent as well. And we're aiming to do all of that in just one single episode here. I wonder if we'll manage it it might be necessary to publish the pronunciation part in another episode, or at least maybe we can do the first part of the pronunciation and finish it off in a second episode, which is what I would normally do in Luke's English Podcast Premium, in fact. Uh, and future episodes of Storytime in Luke's English Podcast Premium will contain a story plus grammar and vocab exercises and a pronunciation section just like this one. <laughs> if you want to sign up, I'm, I'm going to tell you again, if you want to sign up to LEP Premium to get the other episodes in the series when they arrive, plus all the premium content so far, click the link in the show notes or go to teacherluke.co.uk slash premium. All right? Okay. Right. Let's, let's, I'm not going to be selling to you anymore. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Anyway, let's talk about stories and learning English. Okay? So, Stories are great for learning English. We know this, don't we? Stories are a very compelling resource for learning languages. Everyone knows this. It's just a question of finding the right stories with the right level of support from a teacher, reading them or listening to them, and probably applying some kind of study technique. Stories are very immersive and have been effective ways of communicating ideas for thousands of years, right? Apparently, stories work well because when we listen to them or read them, we're able to put ourselves in the shoes of the protagonist of that story. Not literally. I mean, you just put yourself in someone else's shoes. It's just an expression. It doesn't mean that you, what, Luke, what, you mean we have to, like, take our shoes off? No, that's not necessary. It's just an expression. To put yourself in someone else's shoes is kind of like put yourself in their position, see the world through their eyes. And one of the reasons why stories are so effective is that when we listen to them or read them, somehow we are able to kind of put ourselves in the shoes of the protagonist of the story and we kind of experience things with them. It's almost like experiencing the events for ourselves. And this makes stories very vivid and personal. And that's exactly why they're so great for language learning. It seems that we really learn language and remember vocabulary and structures when we absorb them in a very vivid, personal and captivating way. Uh, hopefully the fact that the stories in this series are my own true stories should help that process, especially if you've been listening to me for a while and you've got to know me now. That will also help. Also, we use stories socially a lot to share ideas and communicate concepts and feelings. And humans have been doing this for many, many years. Humans have. I don't know if animals have. I don't know, maybe. Maybe when birds are singing, they're like telling each other stories. I don't know. But anyway, humans, people, we've been using stories socially a lot to share ideas and communication, communicate concepts and feelings. We've been doing this for years. Oral storytelling, the spoken word, is a tradition that uh, goes back way beyond the history of the written word. 
it's kind of part of our DNA now to learn and communicate through spoken stories. Narratives are important. Us humans, we like narratives. They are meaningful to us. Narratives have always been the most effective vehicle for communicating ideas. Think of the way various concepts have been handed down from generation to generation through stories. How we are so touched and mesmerized by movies and books and how the world's religions have narratives at their center. So, you know, the point is that stories are just really important and this is all part of why stories can be a good way of learning a language. Um, there are different types of narrative. There are big ones like the stories in the Bible or the myths and legends that we know. And there are smaller, more personal ones like anecdotes about our lives that we share with people when we meet them. Everyone knows that salespeople or presenters who use stories or some kind of narrative technique always manage to get more success. This is also true of presentations, like the presentations you do at work. Okay, the best TED Talks, for example, seem to tell an emotional story as well as informing you of their subject. It seems to be the way to capture the attention of people as well as to kind of tell them some sort of story with you know, events and uh, feelings and experiences. It's very important to be able to tell stories in English. You need to be able to explain things that have happened to you in your life. We all need anecdotes for social situations, like gatherings where you're trying to make friends with people or establish meaningful connections with them. That could be a party or a work event or a conference or something. We tell people stories about ourselves in order to make connections. Now, the most obvious example of a story we have to tell is the narrative of your own life. People will always ask you about yourself and you need to be able to explain who you are, where you come from, why you chose to do the thing you're doing right now. Uh, or you need to be able to explain the story of your professional career and how you did this and then this and then that and so on. So that's like those moments when you have to describe your CV in a job interview. That's storytelling too. Also, being able to tell anecdotes is very important for social life. Being entertaining, interesting, funny and charming. Right? We all need those stories about ourselves that we can share with people. In terms of language, this all relates to using the right verb tenses, using natural pronunciation with emphasis sentence stress and pausing, and all the vocabulary that you need to tell vivid, engaging, and descriptive narratives in the right style. So I've been thinking about all of this, and also I've noticed that my storytelling episodes of my podcast are often the most popular, which is no surprise. So I thought I had to do more story-based content on my podcast. It's obvious to me. It's what people need, it's what people like, and it's what I like doing too. I do enjoy telling stories, either adventure stories, stories in books, stories for my daughter at bedtime, stories about my life, funny stories on stage in stand-up, stories about history, stories about the Beatles. I just love stories. So what I'm presenting to you here with this new series for LEP Premium, which I'm calling Storytime, is a way to help you learn English with my stories and also to give you the chance to practice telling stories in English in various contexts and to develop your own particular set of English skills in the process. And I do have a specific technique for doing this. It involves stories with transcripts. Stories with transcripts. So let me tell you about the importance of transcripts. So when you have a short text with a transcript and the text is a personal story from the point of view of the storyteller, then you get the recipe for some great English learning resources. The transcript on its own isn't quite enough. You also need the audio. The reason for this is so you can hear the spoken word. This is how you develop your oral English, listening and speaking skills. And this is important because you can't just learn English on paper. 
you need to learn how to do English. And that, uh, that means speaking. The transcript is there to support this mainly because it really helps in English to connect the spoken version to the written version. The two things are quite different. The way words are written isn't the same as the way they are spoken. So if you just work on the written word, you're missing a lot. You're missing how those words are spoken. I mean, this is one of those things that you realise, isn't it, when you're trying to deal with English. You you, you realise, wait a minute, this what's the connection between the spelling and the pronunciation? It's so confusing. So yeah, that's that's true. So you do have to kind of work with the two. You've got to sort of bridge the gap between the spoken word and the written word and, and get to know both versions. So the advantage of having a transcript is that you can easily examine the language that you've heard by looking at the script. But also, when you listen and repeat, you can check that what you're hearing and saying are the right thing. And in this way, you can shadow my pronunciation, for example. You can practice grammar actively and pick up new vocabulary and connect the written version of English to the spoken version of English. All right. <clears throat> and with my story time episodes, you'll get a story from me with a script, plus loads of other practice exercises and comments from me and pronunciation practice too. So I'll support you along the way. Right, so it's time to talk about that specific technique for learning English with stories that I mentioned before. This is the technique you could use with my story time episodes. It's a step-by-step -step approach. Now, it's not revolutionary. I'm not claiming to be coming up with brand new secret ideas here that no one's ever revealed before. But if you're looking for some specific techniques for learning English on your own with my material, then here's how I think you should do it. So, it's, I'm calling it Luke's Storytelling Technique. Essentially, this can be boiled down to this, all right? Did that make sense? Is that a good sentence? This can be boiled down to this. What do you mean? Actually, on my in my transcript, it said, essentially, it can be boiled down to this. So I just misread it. Oh, God. So the storytelling technique can be boiled down to this, meaning it can be essentially reduced to this. Like when you take uh, some food, some sauce, and you boil it down to the uh, sort of essential um, sort of the main part. It could be reduced to this. I'm going to show you. There are more details in each step, as I will explain in a few minutes. But first, to keep it simple, it goes like this, right? So let me just try and put this all on one page. So we've got essentially input, controlled practice, and then output. Right? I told you it's not revolutionary. But it's, it's not about coming up with a revolutionary new technique. It's about coming up with something that you can just follow step by step and something that you will actually do. It doesn't Often you don't need a revolution in your language learning. You just need to do something and do it regularly. So let me break it down. So input. In this, you would what you do is you listen once. So listen to my story once. And you can read the transcript and check any unknown language. I'll go into more detail about how you can do that in a moment. Then you've got... So that's just... Listen and enjoy the story, hopefully. And then you could check the script just to maybe read it too. Because sometimes once you've heard something, you miss certain things because it can be harder to catch things when you're listening because it all flies past you. But when you're reading, you can take time. You can go at your own speed. You can actually see the words and phrases. So you listen and then you read. And you might want to check some unknown language. And then there's the kind of controlled practice section. This is where you, you, you listen and repeat. Now, actually, the pronunciation stage would probably be, probably come later. But in the controlled practice section, you have listen and repeat, which is where you chunk the sentences. I'll explain that in a bit. But it's essentially breaking up the sentences into pieces and pronouncing those pieces um, with pauses in between. So there's the pronunciation practice. It's kind of like shadowing, uh, but it's not exactly the same because it involves hearing a piece of English 
and then repeating it after me and then hearing the next piece and repeating that. Just simple listen and repeat pronunciation drills. Uh, then there's language study, which is where you kind of get into some of the grammar and vocabulary and work with the language a bit. And then output. This is where after you've you've worked on the language in a controlled way, you've worked on the story in a controlled way, in the output section, you try to tell my story in your own words. So you try and retell my story. And then you could think of a similar experience that you've had and try and tell your own story to personalise it. Okay, now I'm going to go into detail about those steps in just a second. So you could consider that to be a cycle because after the output section you can listen to uh, you can listen to my story again one more time starting the process again. It's always good to repeat and you'll find that when you after you've been through that process when you listen to the story again without reading the script you just listen you'll suddenly realize that you understand every single thing. Um, so the steps in detail. So the input part, listen to me telling the story and just try to understand it all and, and enjoy it, hopefully. This should be the fun part. Then you go through the script and you investigate any words or phrases that you don't know. And when I say investigate, I mean this basically. When you come across a word or phrase that you don't know, first of all, you try to guess what it means. So you actually try to guess, which is an important skill to develop, like guessing the meaning of unknown words. Um, so you try to guess what it means using the grammatical context and the meaning context around the word or phrase. Now, to be honest, like guessing the meaning of unknown words and developing that skill, that is a whole other podcast for another time. We could go into that in a lot more detail and go through step by step the process of doing it. But essentially, it's Come up with when you see a word, you just stop for a moment and just consider the context, the meaning context, and the grammatical context as well, because that can help. Helps if you identify uh, if it's a a noun, a verb, or adjective. You know what part of speech it is and stuff. All those things can help you sort of narrow down the meaning. But then you use a good online dictionary to help. This is where you actually get the 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 definition. Now, online dictionaries, good ones you know, use them because there are whole teams of professionals whose job it is to try to help you understand these words. So they're, they're there. There's like people working really hard, mapping out the entire language and giving you all the information you need to know. Um, so I recommend, there's a few different dictionaries you can use, but my favourites are the Oxford Dictionary for Learners of English, the Collins English Dictionary, or the Cambridge Dictionary for Learners of English. Other dictionaries are available. There's the Longman Dictionary of Contemporary English, I think it's called. There's the Macmillan Dictionary. Oxford, Cambridge, Collins, Longman, um, Macmillan. These are sort of my five dictionaries that I use, and they're all, they all have free dictionaries available online, just through a browser. Other dictionaries are available. Sometimes it's a good idea to cross-check the different definitions. Um, all right? And also, don't just look for the definitions. You've got to look for the examples. And there's lots of other information that dictionaries can give you, including the phonetic transcriptions. They, there's often a button where you can hear a person say the word so you can actually hear the pronunciation again. Examples, um, maybe information about how, how common the word is. Dictionaries are amazing. Um, I might clarify uh, these expressions after I tell you each story. So in some cases, I will actually go through some words. But in any case, it's always good to learn ways to research new words yourself so you don't need to rely on someone else to do it. I could do a whole episode on how to use dictionaries to help with your vocabulary. They are full of useful information beyond just the definitions of words. That's another story, another episode for another time. Right. Itchy nose. I've got an itchy nose. Oh, controlled practice is the next step. So, next, you would use the memory tests on the PDFs for my premium episodes to check and practice your grammar and vocabulary. There should be three tests per story. So, uh, a grammar test, usually for verb forms, a vocabulary test for words and phrases, and a prepositions test. 
And this tests a range of language systems which are often overlooked but which are vitally important such as fixed phrases, phrasal verbs or collocations which need prepositions. These are those slippery aspects of English which often make the difference between intermediate and advanced levels and beyond. I mean there's many ways to break language down and it, often it can help to just focus on certain certain little aspects and it's just like the way in. Okay. Um, next, once you've checked unknown words and tested your grammar and vocabulary and kind of like delved into the language a bit, listen again and try to repeat the lines after me. This is the pronunciation practice. I'll give you pronunciation drills to make this easier. And as I said before, I will demonstrate this in the second half of this episode when I actually tell you my story about the bear and I'll do all I'll show you all the things I'm talking about. So, yeah, listen and repeat. I'll give you pronunciation drills to make this easier. Repeat each line, so specifically, repeat each line without looking at the script. Just try to repeat what you hear. Okay? And this will make you focus on the way things are pronounced. Then you can check the script to see if you were saying the same words as me. What people often will do is they will, when they're doing listen and repeat, they want to see the words, they want to be able to see the sentences. But what happens then is your brain starts to decode that your brain, I mean, that can be useful. Listening and reading at the same time definitely can be useful. But what I'm encouraging you to do is first, your first encounter with the language, the f as you try to repeat it, should be the oral version. So it forces you to focus on the way the words and phrases and sentences actually sound, not, and you don't get distracted by the way they look. Um, I'm going to make that point again. In my pronunciation drills, I normally give you the chance to repeat each line a couple of times, but if you like, you can use the skip back button that most podcast apps will have. Skip back if you want to repeat more than twice. So try to copy my intonation, my rhythm, how I pronounce vowel sounds, consonant sounds, and combinations of consonants, and watch out for how I link words together. Maybe the most important thing, though, the most important thing is to notice the stress or emphasis in each line. Certain words or certain syllables in each line will carry more stress than others. This marks the rhythm of the sentences. All right? And English is a stress-timed language, which means that some syllables get more emphasis than others, and the syllables without the stress or emphasis might get squashed. So things like little words or parts of words don't get fully pronounced. They have weak forms. That's a bit complex to understand maybe, but at least try to notice the sentence stress or rhythm of the sentence and copy it. I will demonstrate that uh, in the you know, I'll, I'll demonstrate that in a moment. So try to say the lines also, try to say the lines as I present them to you as one word in some cases. Because again, when you look at a sentence, when you read it, there are spaces between the words. But when you hear someone say those sentences, they don't put spaces where you see them. The spaces come in different places. For example, if I say, try to say the lines as one word in some cases. Now, there was really just one pause there after I said word. Try to say the lines as one word in some cases. Right, and there's another pause next. So, try to say the lines as one word in some cases without pauses between each word. You see? Uh, when I do pronunciation practice, I will break sentences into chunks or pieces. These pieces are pronounced with no spaces between each word. The words are all linked together. The pauses come between each chunk. I'll give you examples of this when we get to the pronunciation drills later in this episode. I'll give you full examples. So you can, you can lis listen to me say each line, repeat them like me, Skip back if you want, repeat it again, and again, and again. Check the script to make sure you're saying the right words, but don't always look at the script when repeating. Instead, 
what you could do is you could just literally hold your hand in front of the line, in front of the words, listen and repeat without looking at the script. Then you reveal the script to check you're saying the words that are written. Okay, so just to say that again, so you'll see the, the, the pronunciation drills and they'll be presented on the PDF. But you listen to me and don't look at the script. Either look away and listen or hold your hand over the sentence or hold a piece of paper or something over, over it so that you don't see it and then just listen and try to repeat and then reveal and re reveal the sentence. You go, ah, right, oh, I see. And that way you can compare any differences between how the line is written and how you expect how you expect it to be said, how I actually say it and how you say it. So compare the differences between how the line is written, how you expect it to be said and how it how I actually say it and how you say it. Try to copy me, not copy the script. Say it like I say it not how it looks. English writing and speaking are different. If you want to focus on your speaking skills, pay attention to how words are spoken, but make sure you know how they are spelled too. Obviously, in English, there are many accents. This is another point. People from different places say the same words differently. I'm from England, and so I have an English accent. That's just another point. I mean, you know, essentially, this the, again, this disparity between the spoken word and the written word. That English is written the same, more or less, with except with slight spelling differences between American and British English, but pretty much we write it in the same way. But there's a huge variety of different ways that those words and sentences are pronounced around the world. So, you know, you might think, oh God, which accent shall I choose? You just choose the one that you feel like you should have. Just feel like, the choose the one you want. The most important thing is that you're intelligible, that people understand you. And stress, rhythm, intonation, pausing and emphasis, all those things are really important for intelligibility. So intelligibility is the thing we should focus on the most. That's basically being clear. Okay, here's an example of what I mean by chunking sentences. So if we do one chunk per line, we can break up the story into the right sections, pause, in fact, I'm, look, I'm actually doing it now. If we do one chunk per line, we can break up the story into the right sections, pause in the right places, add emphasis to the right words, and generally make sure we are telling the story in the correct way, which I think should be very helpful and beneficial. So I, I just did it then. Now that was that's actually one sentence, what I just said there. That's one sentence broken up into chunks. Each chunk can be pronounced with all the words linked. You pause between each line. So for example, if we do one chunk per line, we can break up the story. Let me say that again. We can break up the story into the right sections. Okay, let's just do that again. If we do one chunk per line, we can break up the story into the right sections. So, you see, I just did it. If we do one chunk per line, so that's one, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven words, but they're all linked up together. If we do one chunk per line, if I slow it down, maybe you can see the way the words all run together. If we do one chunk per line, pause, we can break up the story into the right... <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I get it wrong too. It's all part of the fun. We can break up the story into the right sections. Okay. If you're looking at the PDF with me, or if you're if you're looking at the video version of this, you can see that I've kind of used some visuals to to make it clear which words are the stressed words in the sentence or in the line, and how they're all joined together. And also, some words are pronounced with weak forms, like we can break up the story. So, can, that little modal verb there is pronounced with a weak form because it's not one of the stressed words. So, it gets squashed. We can break up the story. Not we can break up the story, but we can break up the story. 
okay into the right sections into the right the right see the becomes small uh, because it's not one of the stressed words or one of the stressed syllables so it's also possible to change the text uh, that I present to you in the PDF to highlight which words or syllables are stressed, any weak forms, and maybe where and how the words are linked in various ways. The thing about linking is called connected speech. There's various ways in which words are connected together. Again, that's a whole other podcast for another time. I have done that. I've done episodes about connected speech in the past. Just check my episode archive for the words connected speech. I think I've got one particular episode all about it. The episode archive, you just go to teacherluke.co.uk slash episodes. Um, mm -hmm. So you can see how I've done that, like used, um, I've, I've highlighted words and things. You can see how I've done that to the two example lines above as I showed you. We could also include phonemic transcriptions of each line because, you know, you might be thinking, wait a minute, there's no connection between the written word and the spoken word. Ah, this is so confusing. Well, the phonemic transcription is the thing that will help you there, okay? Because actually, the phonemic transcription is is a written version of exactly how the thing is pronounced, in, in this case, in my accent, as I'm going to show you. So we could also include phonemic transcriptions of each line to show what they really look like phonetically. So if we go back to that, if we do one chunk per line, we if we do let's let's just make let's just make those a bit bigger there. Oops. If we do one chunk per line, right? I'm just making some of those a bit bigger. Okay. So if you're looking at the PDF, you'll see a, a, a phonemic transcription of that chunk. If we do one chunk per line. Now, if you look at it, if you look at the phonemic transcription, that is actually how you phonetically spell that chunk. If we do one chunk per line. Now, obviously, I think for most of you, if you haven't learned the phonemic script, you'll look at that and you'll be like, oh my God, what's that? That just, that looks like gobbledygook. It looks like another language. Yeah, I know. You may, maybe you don't really want to have to learn the phonemic script, but you should. It's It would be a good idea because it can help you decode uh, English pronunciation. And that could be very useful. I don't always use phonemic script because I just find that most of my learners, most of my listeners, viewers, students in my classes, they haven't learned the phonemic script. And then you end up, you have to spend ages learning the script and there, or often there isn't time. So, I mean, it would be a good idea if you had the time to, to work on the phonemic script and you can, um, how would you do it? I mean, you just have to go, maybe if you go to BBC Learning English Pronunciation, that can help. Or if you download, there's a British Council app, uh, British Council Pronunciation app, he says, Googling it. That's it. Sounds right, it's called. Sounds right. Which is basically the phonemic script and it's interactive. You can press each phoneme and it, it, it makes the sound so you know exactly um, how how all those sounds are pronounced. Anyway, again, that's another story for another time. Uh, the phonemic script. The, the next line was, we can break up the story into the right sections and we can see the phonemic version of that. We can break up the story. We can break up the story into the right sections. Right, there you go. So the phonemic script can be very useful if you if you are willing to take the time. So I'm not going to do the full phonemic transcriptions. I'm not going to do that with the rest of that sentence now though because I want to keep moving. But often, in premium episodes, I do focus on some of those specific pronunciation features while doing pronunciation practice. I'll talk a little bit more about the phonemic script in a moment. Okay, so next, you could print the script and then go through it again with a pen. You know what a pen is, don't you? <laughs> Marking where there, where, where there should be pauses. 
So you get the script of the story and you just kind of go through it with a pen and mark where there should be pauses, marking which words are emphasized, marking how they're emphasized. For example, if, if you're going up, if you're going down and so on. Marking how bits are linked together, noting how some words or phrases sound compared to how they're written. I want to encourage you to try to do those things yourself. I will help you, but the best way for you to learn is to sort of take a bit of responsibility for yourself and try to, you know, realise that you can do these things. You can investigate the language, get in there and try and work out what's going on. And hopefully the things I'm telling you will, will help you understand how to do that. It would help a lot, as I said, if you use the phonemic script as well. On the PDF version of this, you can see the phonemic chart for the for British RP English. Uh, I've, there it is. Um, if you're looking at the video, I'm showing it to you now. Okay, uh, let me go back to the script I was reading. Where was I? On the PDF version, you can see the phonemic chart for British RP English, which is basically the accent I have. Obviously, other accents are available and my position on accents is I love all accents. It's one of my favourite things. I love English in different accents. I also love as a comedian or just as someone who likes to have fun, I like to play with accents if it's appropriate, but I like to try and copy different accents and accents are wonderful and they're beautiful. I love listening to people speaking in different accents and obviously, you know, feel free to just pick an accent. Uh, pick the one you want. I mean, I speak like this, so this is the accent I have. And normally the phonemic script, as you see it in dictionaries, is based on my accent. There it is. Now, this is the, so the, the, the diagram that I showed you, the phonemic script, this is the one from Adrian Underhill's website. By the way, Adrian Underhill wrote a great book about pronunciation, which is called Sound Foundations. I think I've got it somewhere. Where is it? Uh, where is Sound Foundations? I've got it on my shelf somewhere. Uh, I can't locate it at this moment. Never mind. Where is it? Anyway, I've got a copy of that book somewhere. Sound Foundations by Adrian Underhill. It's a great book. But maybe that's for the English teachers. Pronunciation and phonetics is a great and useful subject and definitely would be a good episode for another time. But I've done some stuff. I've done some stuff about phonetics in the premium section. The point is, learning the phonemic script can help you to decode English words, and if you learn all the symbols and sounds, it can help you with your pronunciation. That's another episode for another time. There's the phonemic script if you're checking the PDF and uh, the video for this. Um, it looks confusing. There is a logic to it. The, the, it's, in, it's in three sections, basically. Um, the, the top left section, these are single vowel sounds. The top right section, these are double vowel sounds or diphthongs. And then you've got consonant sounds at the bottom. The If I read through the sounds from top left going to the right, we have e, 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 u, u, right? Those four sounds, e, e, u, u. And you notice, if you can see me doing this, that my mouth goes from wide sort of like the, the position of my lips go starts wide and goes forward where the lips are brought together in a sort of a like little circle, like a pout. E, I, U, U. So that shows the way that the lips go from wide to sort of gathered together. And if I go from the top left down, we go, we have E, E, A, and you see that in that direction, my jaw is going down. This is kind of interesting because it shows you that the different mouth positions when we're pronouncing vowels, either your your lips are wide, like in the E sound, E, or your lips are to get like um, pulled in together, like a pout, like in the O, or and O words, sounds, I mean. And also the jaw, so either the jaw is low or or higher so it's like up and down jaw wide and and uh, narrow lip position these are the sort of position movements so i'll go through them again e e 
e e u sorry e e u u then uh e u u or a a a o a a a o this is fun isn't it folks <laughs> I've made this joke before. If you're listening to me, if you've got this playing on a speaker or something, and I'm going e e u u u u or u, people will be like, "Wait, what are you listening to?" If you've got this playing on your Bluetooth speaker in your home, and people are like, "What? What is that? What? Uh, u a uh, u a uh, u?" Uh. <laughs> um, I could go through the rest of this, but basically these are all double ones: e a a, and so on. And then the consonant sounds p, b, t, d, ch, j, k, g, f, v, th, v, s, z, sh, j. Now, do you notice actually that these are in pairs? They're all pronounced in the same way p, b, same lip position, tongue position, p, b. The difference is that the second one here, b in this case, is pronounced with your voice. Uh. First one has no voice. Second one is the same thing, but with a voice. B, p, b. Same thing here. T and d, t, d. Pronounced in the same way, but the d sound has the voice and t doesn't. Ch and and j, k and g, f and v, f and v, s and z, sh and j, and then others as well anyway right there is some logic to that diagram it's very interesting when you get into it uh adrian underhill sound foundations so let me just say this again the full script of this episode including the story which i'm going to start in a minute and all the exercises are available as a pdf download in two versions one for your phone with large letters and one to be read on paper or on your computer with normal letter size check the links in the description to download them uh, it, you don't have to enter your email address or anything that you just literally click the link and it takes you straight to the pdf i'm not going to try and get your email address and send you emails and stuff um unless you sign up to LEP Premium, and then sometimes I might send you an email to say, hi, here's some new content. All right. Uh, anyway, again, this is what you always get in episodes of LEP Premium, all the PDFs and stuff. Not You don't get videos every time, but whenever I, whenever I can do it, I do it. Uh, and then we've got the output section. Remember, we were in a process, my storytelling technique, the output section. Try to tell the story in your own words without the script. Right, so this is where you, you've been working the script on the screen or if you've printed it on paper, if you don't care about the environment or if you're going to keep them forever, you're not just going to throw them away. Anyway, so you've, you've been working on it and then you put all the script away and you just, you've been working with my story a few, you know, for a while, repeating after me, working on the language. Now you just go, okay, all right, let's try and tell Luke's story. And you try and tell the story in your own words without the script. You've become pretty familiar with the story now, so try to say it out loud without the script. It doesn't matter if you change some details. You could record yourself doing this and review it later, or you could do it with a friend. And so when you do that, it could be like this. Your friend is the teacher and has the script, and you try to tell the story while your friend gives you a few clues to help you remember what comes next or gives you a little corrections if necessary. Okay, so that, that's if you do it with your friend. So you kind of like, your friend's like, okay, go. And you go, okay, so I was uh, in the forest and I was walking along and suddenly, uh, you know, uh, suddenly um, a bear, a bear um, uh, attacked me and um, and it, it pulled my head off. No, 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 pulled, pulled, pulled. It pulled my head off. That's not the actual story, but that's just an example. You could do that with a friend where your friend's the teacher and you're the learner and then you swap you become the teacher and your friend becomes the learner or you do it on your own and you switch between the roles you're trying to tell the story and then uh, and then you have a quick look at the, the script quick put your glasses on remind you and then okay and then you carry on try to make your telling of the story interesting 
don't just recite it like a robot. I was walking in the forest and suddenly I saw a bear and I was terrified, you say, with a dead look in your eyes. No, no. Try and put some feeling into it as well. Imagine you're trying to entertain people. So I was walking through the forest. It was really dark and I was completely lost. And my phone was my phone had run out of batteries. I couldn't listen to Luke's English podcast. And then I heard a noise and I thought, oh my God, what is that? What's that noise? And then I got eaten by a bear, you know. Put some feeling into it. Basically, tell my story in your own words, either the same as mine or change it a little bit if you want. Um, then you could write the story and then uh, compare your written version to the script. Again, it doesn't have to be exactly the same, but my version can be a sort of guide or benchmark for you when you write your version. Next, consider changing the point of view when you retell my story, either orally or in writing. You could change the point of view. You could tell the story in the first person, so I did this, I did that, or the second person, you did this, you did that, or the third person, Luke did this, Luke did that. Now, when you're using past tenses, this isn't so tricky because the conjugation is pretty much the same. Thank God for English conjugation being kind of simple. I, you know, you did, I did, they did, she did, it did. It's just did all the time. Or, okay, maybe some of those irregular verbs are more difficult. I, but it's not really. I went, you went, he went, she went, they went, it went. It's just so much easier than some languages. I'm not saying English is easy because it's difficult in other ways, but anyway, like try using different uh, perspectives. As I said, when you're using past tenses, this isn't so tricky. But in other tenses, it it does force you to remember things like adding uh, s or es on the end of verbs and so on, and that could be tricky because it can also it sometimes adds a syllable, you know. Um, so just little things which can make a big difference. It's all forcing you to practice doing things correctly. Okay, then tell your own, try to tell your own story in speaking and or in writing. So do you have a similar experience you can describe? Have you ever been eaten by a bear? <laughs> if you have, how did you, what happened? Maybe you could rewrite my story completely. The main thing is be creative here and come up with your own story and tell it, either on paper or out loud, even if it is just into your phone. Or if you've got a teddy bear, just tell the story to the teddy bear. Hopefully that teddy bear won't eat you. <laughs> um, and here you can just go go a bit crazy if you want and let your imagination run wild. You could you could correct all the grammar and stuff later if you're writing it or re recording it just like have fun in the final in this final creative section here and then later you can come back and sort of like go into grammar mode and or whatever it is pronunciation mode and try and correct yourself and then finally listen to my story one more time and enjoy the fact that you now understand every single detail so essentially the process is input practice output it's not a new idea Input, listen to the episode, notice the language. Practice, do my tests and my listen and repeat pronunciation drills and check the script. Output, try to tell your own story. So it could be a retelling of mine or and and or a completely new story based on a similar experience you've had. Or fiction, just make up a work of fiction. Don't, be don't feel you have to be constrained by reality. You're just practicing language. So you can do that with every single story I publish and you'll see that over time you'll make a huge... It, 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 let me start that sentence again. Sometimes English is difficult for me too. Sometimes. Why did I sound like Barack Obama then? Sometimes English is difficult for me too. Y you can do that process with every single story I publish and you'll see that over time it'll make a huge difference to your English. Okay. A lot of this is about practice, time and repetition. Just doing it once will be good, but you'll get the best results by doing it again and again. When a story time episode arrives in LEP Premium, you can go through the process and just follow my instructions in the episode and on the PDF. 
Sometimes I tell stories in the free podcast too and there might be transcripts or automatic subtitles on YouTube that can help you. But in the premium episodes I do my best to give you all the support you need in a convenient way. If you use the memory tests in the PDF and you do all the listen and repeat drills it will make all the difference. So many skills are involved in this kind of work. There's listening, there's grammar, there's vocabulary, there's pronunciation, there's memory. Now I'm not saying this technique is the the be-all and end-all of learning. Obviously other things are important like speaking practice with a person, engaging in conversation. This is also vital. But using my materials and methods can definitely make a big difference. I know this because people who've listened to my podcast and applied these sorts of things as well as just listening that they've they've I've talked to them they've told me first-hand evidence that it's made a big difference go back to the Wispolep series why I should be on Luke's English podcast that I did last year listen to the interviewees and in many cases they were doing all of these sorts of things and it made a big difference okay so you are absolutely bound to learn vocabulary, grammar and pronunciation like this. All you need to do is do it with every episode. All you need to do is just make sure you don't stop. Just keep it up every time. This is maybe the difficult thing, right? Like actually doing it. Make it a habit. Listen to the audio, follow my instructions and do the exercises I present to you. It's all about long-term regular practice. Make it a habit to go through my process with every story time episode that I publish in this series and also go back into the back catalogue of premium episodes, listen to them and use the PDF worksheets. They're not all story episodes but they are still full of language teaching, focusing on English which has come up in my in natural conversations on my podcast. So you can do all of that. But if this sounds like too much work and you don't like the idea of me giving you homework and you just think, oh, I can't, I'm too busy, I can't be bothered, then, right, if that's the case, then don't worry about it. If you, if you really prefer, you can just sit back and listen to the stories for entertainment without doing any other work. It's up to you. I mean, that will also help. That is another technique. Just chill, relax, Press play and enjoy. Ah, the time to just listen and not do anything else. That's fine as well. But if you are really serious about this and you want to get the maximum benefit from my episodes, then you'll follow my technique. There it is. I've made it clear. I've spelled it out for you. Now it's up to you. Right, so my stories then, and I'm going to tell you that bear story. I told you, long episode, but that's all right free this one as well. So, my stories. I've been I've been searching my memory, right? I've been trying to I've been look, going through my memory. I'm thinking, right, I need stories. So I've been searching my memory, my creativity, moments from my life in order to produce stories for this project. Most of these stories will come from my own life, but I also uh, might include other stories I've found elsewhere too. Uh, sometimes I'll use anecdotes that I've told on the podcast before, but presented this time with scripts and worksheets. So, yeah, I might tell the story of how I met Dave Grohl one more time. <laughs> so you can expect a range of different stories about different things, mostly from my life experience, but also I'll be picking stories from elsewhere, things I've found online, stories about other things and so on. And it's not, by the way, I said that, you know, I'll tell some stories I've told before. There are plenty of new things as well. I've tried to write lots of new stories that you've never heard before too. But in any case, you can expect Storytime episodes to arrive in LEP Premium over the next few months. Summer will be a busy period for me, but I'll be doing my best to provide episodes for you on a regular basis. Now, I could stop here. We've been going for about an hour. I could stop here, but I thought I would share one of my stories. I promised it. I better deliver it. There's no need to stop now. 
let's let's carry on. I thought I would share one of my stories now and give you a demonstration of what story time episodes will involve. So the story I'm going to share here is called A Close Encounter with a Bear. So before you listen, let me just explain a couple of things. So an encounter, an encounter, a close encounter. So this is the word that we use to describe when you meet an animal without expecting to. This is this is one of the meanings of encounter. It's when you sort of meet something or come across something without expecting to. Normally, a living thing, you might encounter... It could be a person, but normally you meet a person or bump into a person. You might encounter a celebrity, but you would encounter an animal. You might have an encounter with an alien. There's a movie called Close Encounters of the Third Kind, a Steven Spielberg film, which is all about aliens. It's a great film. So anyway, let's just say the word encounter is when you dis when you meet an animal without expecting to. For people, we'd probably say to bump into someone. For example, oh, I bumped into Paul McCartney the other day. Yeah, I was in a shop and he happened to be standing in front of me in the queue. So, you know, we had a bit of a chat and I'm going round to his place tomorrow for dinner, which is nice. There's a little story there. In fact, a mini story. I don't know how many words that was, but anyway. So we use the word encounter when you meet an animal because you don't really, we don't really meet animals, you know. We don't really meet animals like, hello, how do you do? Oh, you're a bear. How nice. Pleasure to meet you. Always nice to meet a bear. Please don't rip my arm off. <laughs> yeah, can I have my hand back now, please? Thank you. So we don't actually meet animals. We, we encounter them and because it's often unexpected, right? So a, 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 an encounter with a bear. So this is the story of when I had an unexpected encounter with a bear. I told the story once quite briefly in an old episode from the archive. To be specific, it was Luke's English podcast number 292 called The California Road Trip Part 5. Long-term listeners, do you remember that? So I did briefly touch on that story then. But here is the story presented in more detail in Luke's English Podcast Premium, or at least a free sample of it. So can you follow specifically what happened, how I felt, and why I felt that way? So basically, just try and follow the story. We'll do some language practice exercises after I've told you the story, or at least I'll sort of show them to you. They'll be available in the PDF, so you can do them in your own time as well. So Remember, all of this is transcribed on the PDF for this episode. Just check the show notes. It's there. There's the PDF for the worksheet, PDF in, in, in large text for the phone, open on your phone. And there's also a PDF for the story, just the script of the story. There's no need to give your email address or anything. You can just get it easily, just like with every premium episode. There's also a PDF, as I've, I've said this already, there's also a PDF with just the story transcript and none of these other notes. So, so you can jump straight to the story. So here we go. We got there, the story. So my close encounter with a bear. Here we go. So let me tell you about a time when I had a close encounter with a bear. This happened on my honeymoon in 2015. My wife and I decided to do a tour of California over about two and a half weeks. I insisted that our tour include a visit to Yosemite National Park, which is a huge wilderness area surrounding a canyon and is home to some of the most famous rock formations, mountains and cliff tops in the world. I don't know if you've heard of it or been there. It's a fantastic place, Yosemite National Park in California. Trees and mountains and stuff. So. My wife wasn't entirely sure about this as it involved camping in the forest and she's not very outdoorsy. In the end, I convinced her. I made sure we had plenty of mosquito repellent, including those smelly anti-mosquito bracelets that you can get. You know those? You wear them around your wrist and they're supposed to keep the mosquitoes away. I don't really know if they work, but I thought that if they made my wife feel a bit more comfortable, they'd be worth bringing. So the park is in a valley in the middle of a large area of mountain and forest. It's a great place for hiking, sightseeing and climbing, but the area is also home to plenty of wildlife, including bears, 
which stay up in the mountains during the day and descend into the valley at night in search of food. They're usually attracted by the smells of people cooking at the campsites and the rubbish that people leave out, and this can be a problem. So, when you enter the camping area, there are loads of signs everywhere warning you of the danger of bears. The signs all say these things very clearly. The bears have a super strong sense of smell, so their noses are something like eight times more, sens more sensitive than a dog's. Okay, They are extremely curious. They will investigate anything that smells like food, and that includes your rubbish and also your cosmetics and bathroom products and stuff. If you get trapped in a corner with a bear, if you block its exit or it has young cubs nearby, those bears can be extremely dangerous. So, you have to put any food or any products that smell, including shampoo, soap, etc., into special heavy-duty metal boxes or bear boxes. These can be locked and unlocked with a large handle that the bears can't operate because they're not quite as clever as humans in most cases. I mean, I suppose it depends on the humans. <laughs> anyway, after our first day in the canyon, we retired for the evening, made sure everything was in the bear box, and we lay down on our camping mattress in our tent to sleep. We were in what is called a semi-permanent tent. So it had three walls made of brick, and then just two canvas curtains at the front which opened out into the forest. Directly in front of these curtains were some seats, a campfire pit and the bear box. The curtains were held closed by a couple of little strings. That was all that stood between us in our tent, in our camping bed and the forest outside. Okay. Lying on our camping mattress lying down on our camping mattress, we could hear the sounds of nature around us and the occasional sound of some people moving around and talking nearby. Eventually, we fell asleep, but in the middle of the night, I woke up to a strange sound. I listened for a while and realised that something was scratching and poking the bear box just outside our tent, just on the other side of the curtain. Something was definitely investigating our box and trying to open it. I could hear scratching, and if I listened closer, bear in mind this is only about two metres away from where we had our heads on the pillows, if I listened closer, I could hear some breathing and the sound of teeth and jaws biting and scraping against the box. Now, bear in mind that the box was only about two metres away from us on the other side of a canvas curtain in the entrance to our tent. So, I suddenly became terrified when I realised that it was a bear right there in front of us. Obviously, I couldn't actually see it, but I was convinced that it was a bear. I'd seen all the documentaries about bears, bear attacks, polar bear attacks, people being eaten by bears and more. I'd seen the documentaries. I knew what had happened. I knew what happened in The Revenant with Leonardo DiCaprio. I'd seen all the warning signs around the campsite. Now there was an actual bear just outside our actual tent, very close to our, our soft, probably delicious human bodies. <laughs> um, I started thinking about whether the bear would decide to investigate our tent. Remember how curious they are? Was there anything smelly that would attract it? I was lying there thinking, still, my wife was sleeping, and this is what was running through my mind. Is that Will the bear uh, try to investigate the tent? I realised that my wife and I were still wearing the anti-mosquito bracelets, which were quite smelly. And I expected to see the muzzle of the bear poking in between the front flaps of the tent 
which were held on only by a simple bit of string. <laughs> Surely it would come and investigate us. I thought that at any moment we would come face to face with a bear. What would I do? Scream? Punch it? Could I really punch a bear in the face? At this point, I decided I should, I should wake up my wife because she was still asleep, right? I thought that she might want to be awake for this to see her newly wed husband either punch a bear in the face or get mauled to death by one, maybe both. I just thought that we should experience that together, you know, because we'd recently made marriage vows about that kind of thing in sickness and in health, till death do us part, etc. I know it didn't say anything about bears in the marriage vows, but I decided to wake her up anyway. So I gently and quietly woke her up like this. Dar darling, darling, darling. What? You know, she, she was annoyed that I'd woken her up. What? And I was like, shh, there's a, there's a bear, there's a bear. There's a bear just outside our tent. There's a bear out there. She started laughing at me. She could not control herself. This was hilarious for her. Just me. She found this hilarious. Meanwhile, I was panicking about the huge beast that was just a couple of steps away. I was like, shut up, shut up, shut up. There's a, shut up, there's a bear. I don't think she understood the danger we were in. Because, you know, she's from the city. She was born and raised in Paris. I don't think she really knows animals. <laughs> so I think she didn't fully understand the threat, the danger, the peril. I said bear, and I think in her mind it was like the teddy bear's picnic or something. I don't know. So there I was between danger and ridicule in the middle of a forest in America. So I know what you're thinking now. You're thinking, Luke, what happened? Did you get killed by a bear? And yes, I did. I got killed by a bear and I'm dead now. The end. <laughs> no, not really, of course. What happened is that we lay there for a while listening and eventually the sounds of scratching and breathing went away. The bear must have walked away and moved on to another bear box or something. I know that's perhaps not the dramatic ending you were hoping for, but that is what happened. The next day, I read up on bears in Yosemite National Park. Bears in Yosemite National Park. I read up on it and I learned more. I found out that they are black bears. And of all the bear species in the United States, the black bears are in fact the least dangerous. That's not to say they're not dangerous at all, because as I said before, they can be. But they're not like polar bears or grizzly bears. They won't attack people unless they absolutely have to. I, I don't think polar bears and grizzly bears always attack people anyway. But the, if they are hungry, they might. But these black bears in Yosemite are not likely to be that hungry. So they won't attack people unless they absolutely have to. They will usually avoid us completely and can be scared off quite easily by just making a lot of noise. Attacks by black bears are very rare, so actually they're fine. They're quite nice in fact. And just I'll add an additional point here. The signs warning people of bears are there to protect the bears as much as it is to protect the people. Because when bears and people get together, <laughs> they don't have a great time. They don't like, hey bears, let's have a beer. Instead, often it ends up being a bit complicated and sometimes the bears are the ones that might even be put down, which means they might have to be killed if there's a situation where, you know, when things can get complicated quite easily. These are large animals. They can be dangerous. Um, they don't want to attract bears into the park. Sometimes bears get hit by cars and stuff that drive around in the park, you know. They want to try to reduce the contact between bears and humans as much as possible, not just for the sake of the humans, but for the sake of the bears as well. So anyway, the bears are actually fine. They're, they're, they're quite nice, in fact. So the next night, I was much more comfortable and slept well. And in the end, it was all okay, and I was absolutely fine. My wife got eaten by a bear, 
but I was fine. The end. Of course she didn't. This is just a joke. At the end of the story, I just wanted to make you laugh. So there you go. That was my story of uh, the bear. Now, before I talk about language practice exercises, here are some additional comments about this story. I often use this bear story when playing the lying game in class with my students. The lying game is a speaking exercise in which people tell stories and other members of the class have to ask questions and guess if the story is true or not. I've done it on the podcast lots of times with Amber and Paul. To demonstrate the game, I tell my students this story and they have to guess if it's true or not. Right? Now, it's a true story, 100% true. But most people usually think that this is not a true story, which means I get lots of points in the game because it is completely true. I've told it before on the podcast, in fact, in episode 292, California Road Trip Part 5, as I said. Um, so here are comments or questions that my students ask me when I tell them this story. I thought these th sorts of things might be in your mind. So they say things like this. Weren't there any armed guards in the park protecting visitors from bear attacks? Well, in fact, it's not necessary, really. The bears aren't that dangerous, despite what I had in my head. In fact, when bears and people come into contact with each other, it's usually the bears who end up getting hurt. They can be hit by cars. They can climb inside cars to find food. And sometimes the bears have to be put down, meaning killed, if they are in a potentially dangerous situation. So the park rangers prefer to keep the bears away from the park. And the best way to do this is to make sure that there is no food lying around that will attract them. Hence, the bear boxes. Next thing that students ask me is this. Why didn't you call for help? Well, I don't know, really. I guess I didn't get to that point. But if the bear had tried to come into the tent, then I certainly would have screamed and made noise. Apparently, you're supposed to just scream and shout, and they don't like that, and that will make them run away. I don't think they would let people... Another comment from students is this. I don't think they would let people camp in this place if there were bears. Well, like I said, the bears generally don't hurt people and the safety measures are for the protection of the bears as much as for the protection of the people. So, yeah, people camp there and stuff. Um, and they just include lots of safety measures. So, the next thing is this. So, Luke, you didn't actually see the bear. It's true, I didn't. How could you be so sure it was one? This is true, I, we didn't actually see it. But what else could it have been? And the bears are very common. They do come down. They do check the bear boxes. They do investigate these smells. They're, they're very common. Um, but what else could it have been? Scratching. The sounds of biting on the box. I could hear it. I mean, you know, like... Kind of... It was obvious to me. The breathing, a sort of snorting sound. <laughs> Sounds. I mean, I, I can't think of what else, and unless there was a a guy, <laughs> a drunk man loose in the park, <laughs> desperately trying to get food from my bear box. I don't think so. So here's a quick summary of the story. This is basically, this is what happened in just a few sentences. So my wife and I went on our honeymoon to the USA. One of the places we visited was Yosemite National Park, where we did some camping. In the park, there are some bears and occasionally they will come into the camping areas to look for food. At the campsite, we had to put all our food and products into sturdy metal boxes so the bears wouldn't be able to steal it. While my wife was sleeping in our tent, a bear, I think, I'm pretty sure, a bear tried to open our bear box. I could hear the bear scratching and biting the box just a couple of meters from where we were sleeping. I was terrified. I woke up my wife, but she just thought it was funny that I was so scared. Thankfully, the bear eventually went away and everything was okay. That's it. So, I mean, you know, that's the basic version of the story. I mean, obviously, I added some colour and, you know, I tried to make the story entertaining. I didn't just, it's not just, let me impart the basic facts of the story to you. It was more like, I'm going to tell you the story, but, I, you know, I'm going to try and make it an enjoyable story. And I think it's important when we tell anecdotes and things that we do make them funny. This is sort of like fun, isn't it? This is just what life's all about, isn't it? Um, so, language practice exercises working with the story. 
Let me check. My wife just called me. Um, I'll need to call her back. I need to sort of... We need to get a move on here. So let me just go through some of the stuff that you can use to help you with your English here. So language practice exercises working with a story. Here is how you can use my storytelling technique to work on your English with this story. Just follow my instructions. You've already listened to the story, so you've done the input part. Now we have to move to the controlled practice part. There are two ways of doing this, on paper and pronunciation. So let's start with exercises on paper. That's grammar and vocabulary. On the paper part, you can pause the podcast, go to the PDF or check the pages for this episode, then do the exercises. The exercises are just down there, he says, pointing to, to the, you know, pointing downwards. You will see gapped versions of the original story. Grammar, verb forms. So the first version of the story has verbs missing. I've taken out most of the verbs from the transcript. You have to put them back in in the correct form. So we can focus on verb tenses, narrative verb forms, but also other types of verb forms such as gerunds and infinitives. Those moments when the verb is in the ing form or the base form. I want to highlight instances where either an infinitive, for example, to go, is used or a gerund, going is used to help attach verb phrases into sentences or when making participle clauses and so on. So as well as verb forms for past tenses and conditionals, etc., look out for gerunds and infinitives too. Basically, all the times when the verbs are used in various forms. Vocabulary. The second version, you will find, has vocabulary removed. Now, it's obviously a lot of words. So I just picked out some of the words and just removed them. Essentially, any, I said, meaningful items of vocabulary, which I think are worth learning, have been gapped. You have to put them back in. This should force you to notice the different words and expressions which I used. Just simple exercise. I mean, often it's not rocket science. It's just a question of forcing you to notice certain things, forcing you to work with the language a little bit more than just reading it and listening to it. In both cases, the grammar and the vocabulary, the verbs and vocabulary items are given to you in a box in alphabetical order. It's up to you to choose the right ones and put them in the right form. So you might need to change the form of those words and put them into the spaces. Then prepositions. The third version of the story focuses on prepositions. I've removed the prepositions from the story and you have to put them back in. And this will test things like collocations, phrasal verbs and more. Test but also highlight these parts of uh, the language. So that's the paper part. You can check all your answers by returning to the original story script uh, to check. And then pronunciation exercises. Then the pronunciation part basically involves repeating the story after me line by line. I'll break the story into chunks with pauses and sentence stress highlighted and you have to repeat it all after me. So, and then free practice, try and retell the story. Then after the controlled pronunciation work, there's the free part where you have to retell the story yourself. Try to tell the story again without reading it from the script. Don't worry if your version isn't exactly the same as mine. Just try to tell the story in your own words. If you use the same language as I did, great. If you find another way to do it, that's okay too. Let's say though that you should be trying to use my version in order to essentially take on the language that I use. And then tell your own story. And then you can try to think of a similar experience you've had and describe that either by speaking or writing or by writing. It doesn't have to be a, with a bear. In this case, it's like, have you ever had an encounter with an animal? Basically, a, a snake, a spider, a mouse, whatever. Um, okay, so then we've got the language practice exercises, which are on the PDF. Now, I'm not going to go through them all here. I'll just show them to you. So it says language practice exercises, grammar, verb forms. Put the verbs in the box into the correct gaps in the text. Use the correct verb forms in each case. Sometimes you might need to add an auxiliary verb like have, be or do. Check the original text when you've finished for the answers. So this version that I'm, that I'm showing on the screen while recording the video doesn't look great. It, it's going to look best on the normal uh, PDF version. But we've got verbs like bring, cook, have, include, surround, and so on. 
And then there's, you know, the story. Let me hmm you about a time when I hmm a close encounter with a bear. This hmm on my honeymoon. My wife and I hmm to do a tour of California. So you just have to put the verbs back in. Some of them are easy. Some of them are less easy. Okay, so there's that. I'll let you do that yourself in your own time on the PDF. I mean, for example, the park is in a valley in the middle of a large area of mountain and forest. It's a great, it's a great place for what? It's a great place for... So what's the verb form? The verb is camp. But what form is it? It's a great place for camping, hiking, uh, sightseeing, I think was the other verb. So, you know, there you go. Gerund, in that case. The area is also home to plenty of wildlife. <laughs> Bears. What would that be? Well, it, the verb is include. So, and it's a gerund. The area is home to plenty of wildlife, including bears. Okay. Now, I'm just showing you the exercises here. I'm not going to go through all of the explanations and stuff uh, at this point. But there it is. Exercises are there. It's not the entire story. I'm just scrolling through it. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. It's not the entire story. You know, I don't want to overload you with work. So that's just the first half of the story, I would say. And then it says, that's enough. No need to do the entire story. Check your answers by looking at the original script. Okay, now you might want me to give you comments and stuff, but I mean, I'm trying to keep this brief here. Let's move on to vocabulary. So for the vocabulary, it's it's more or less the same thing. Can you remember the missing vocabulary from the story? I've given you the first letter in each case. So I actually, I haven't given them to you in a box. I've just given you the first letter. So let me tell you about a time when I had a close eh something with a bear. Well, you know now. Look, the answer's there. <laughs> a close encounter. All right, and that's easy, but i just just forcing you to do it, and you'd have to write it if you've printed it. It all helps. This happened on my hmm in 2015. Why, would, why were we in California? Because it was our honeymoon, right? And so on and so forth with other words removed, you know, m more words, um, sense of smell, extremely curious, uh, trapped in a corner with a bear, uh, heavy duty metal boxes, um, lay down on our camping mattress, a couple of little strings, okay, the occasional sound of some people moving around, scratching and poking the bear box, and so on. Okay, all right, not the entire story. Again, that is enough. It says on the PDF, you can check your answers by looking at the original version. And then we get prepositions. To help you notice preposition collocations, prepositions of place and movement, and also phrasal verbs or dependent prepositions, do this exercise. All uh, uh, And the missing prepositions, all possible prepositions are provided in the table. Well, I've... Oh, hold on a minute. I need to edit this. All possible prepositions are provided in the table. I'm not doing that because... Or maybe I am. <laughs> I haven't finished the worksheet. Obviously, I've got some work to do there. Or will I? Will I give you the prepositions or not? I, th I, I think I'm not going to because there aren't that many prepositions. I think probably at your level, you don't need me to provide them in a box. Let me tell you mm, a time when I had a close encounter, mm, a bear. Let me tell you about a time, because it's tell you about, when I had a close encounter, with a bear, because it's to have a close encounter with something. This happened in mm, my honeymoon, right? This happened on my honeymoon in mm, 2015, in 2015. Some of these are easier than others, but it's still good to do them all. Now we fly through those. I'll let you do them in your own time. You can check the script afterwards to check your answers. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Just the first part of the story, that's enough. To check your answers, just look at the script for the original story. All right, so that's where it says that's enough. But let me just go through some of those prepositions quickly just to highlight the collocations. So we have things like tell you about something, to have an encounter with something, 
to be on your honeymoon in 2015 and so on. That's the sort of thing we're looking at. If you want to continue the exercise with the rest of the script, why not make your own exercise? You could do this yourself. You can just copy paste the story into a text editor like Microsoft Word, for example. Go through the text and remove all prepositions. Just replace them with a gap like the one you can see. Then when you've finished, try to put the prepositions back in. So you've removed them and then you just wait a minute and then try and put them back in. Can you put them back in the right place? It forces you to notice how uh, English is in these phrases, like to have uh, an encounter with something, you know? It's not just the word encounter. It's have an encounter with something. Okay, so this will help, I promise. Another idea is to remove every ninth word. Just count the words in the story and remove every ninth word. Then look at the text again and try to put the words back in from memory. This will force you to no notice certain bits of language, including grammar and vocabulary collocations. Trust me, this works. And then pronunciation. Finally, near the end of the episode, we're nearly there. This has been like an English lesson. To be honest, my English lessons in my classes are about 90 minutes or two hours long. So it's kind of like that. When you think about it in those terms, this is not a super long, you know, it doesn't have to be 10. What can I achieve in 10 minutes? No, this is a proper lesson, like my lessons at school. Except in the lessons at school, my students do a lot more talking than this. Uh, pronunciation. So for this section, I've broken the story into chunks. These are groups of words which are separated by pauses. Just repeat each chunk after me. That's it. I will do the first three paragraphs of the story here, okay, in, in this part, in this in Premium 35 Part 1. For pronunciation practice with the entire story, you'll have to listen to Part 2 of this, which will be a pronunciation exercise. And that will only be for the Premium subscribers. So Part 1 is free, Part 2 is going to be an, a Premium episode, just as, as usual. So anyway, let's look at a chunked version of the first three paragraphs of this story. Premium subscribers should know what I mean when I say a chunked version. Anyway, I described it earlier on in the episode. There's a whole episode of LEP Premium about chunking with a video as well. Um, so check that out. So a chunked version of the story, the first three paragraphs. So just try to repeat each line or each chunk after me. Don't just listen to me saying these lines. You have to repeat these lines after me out loud. Don't be embarrassed, it's fine. I'm telling you to do it so it's not weird. You don't need to feel awkward or anything, just repeat after me. Even if you can't do it out loud, if you're in public or something or there's a bear sleeping next to you and you don't want to disturb it, at least mouth the lines silently. At least like that. Don't just listen to me saying these sentences. This will work if you actually try to repeat these lines. Trust me. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm a qualified English teacher. Notice how each chunk is pronounced without gaps or pauses between the words. In each chunk there are stressed words highlighted in bold on the PDF. As I've said before, I could go into all the analysis of the phonetics here with connected speech and so on, but let's just try and keep this simple and just try to copy me. Try to do it exactly like me and don't be distracted by the way the words look on the page. Focus on the way these lines sound, not how they look. Copy the sounds. I will give you some silence after each line. That's when you should be repeating after me. Okay, let's begin. So, my close encounter with a bear. My close encounter. That's where you repeat. My close encounter with a bear. Let me tell you about a time when I had a close encounter with a bear. This happened on my honeymoon in 2015. My wife and I 
decided to do a tour of California over about two and a half weeks. So, my wife and I decided to do a tour of California over about two and a half weeks. I insisted that our tour include a visit to Yosemite National Park. which is a huge wilderness area surrounding a canyon. Surrounding a canyon. I should be doing these twice. And is home to some of the most famous rock formations. And is home to some of the most famous rock formations. Mountains and cliff tops mountains and cliff tops in the world. I don't know if you've heard of it or been there. It's a fantastic place. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, okay, sorry about that. I don't know if you've heard of it or been there. I don't know if you've heard of it or been there. It's a fantastic place. It's a fantastic place. My wife wasn't entirely sure about this. My wife wasn't entirely sure about this. as it involved camping in the forest. As it involved camping in the forest. And she's not very outdoorsy. And she's not very outdoorsy. Someone who's outdoorsy means that they're the sort of person who sort of likes being outdoors, you know, likes camping and is happy to be outside in in uh, in nature or something so she's not very outdoorsy she's she's more and more outdoorsy all the time i have to say right in the end in the end i convinced her i convinced her i made sure we had plenty of mosquito repellent I made sure we had plenty of mosquito repellent. Including those smelly anti-mosquito bracelets that you can get. Including those smelly anti-mosquito bracelets that you can get. You wear them around your wrist. You wear them around your wrist. And they're supposed to keep the mosquitoes away. And they're supposed to keep the mosquitoes away. I don't really know if they work. I don't really know if they work. But I thought that if they made my wife feel a bit more comfortable, but I thought that if they made my wife feel a bit more comfortable, they'd be worth bringing. They'd be worth bringing. Now, actually, we're going to stop there. Okay. Now, as I said before, if you want to get the rest of that, You'll need to uh, you'll need to check out part two. 
Okay, so if you want pronunciation drills for the whole story, you can listen to part two of this episode. That's P35 part two, which will be available soon. But you need to be a premium subscriber for that. But now that is the end of this episode of Luke's English Podcast Premium, available free here on Luke's English Podcast. If you want to sign up to LEP Premium and get access to the full episode archive, there's about there's like nearly 150 episodes already, plus all the forthcoming stories in the Storytime series, then go ahead and click the link in the show notes. But that's it for the podcast today, though. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching if you're watching the video version on YouTube. Um, leave your comments below. In the Storytime episodes, there won't be that massive section at the beginning where I talked about the Storytime technique and the process. I won't be doing that. It'll just be straight to the story, then you, you'll have your grammar and vocab and prepositions exercises in the PDF and then straight to the pronunciation. So the episodes will not be long like this. They'll be much shorter and much more contained. But anyway, that's it. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Have a lovely day, lovely morning, lovely afternoon, lovely evening or night, uh, lovely night. Try not to be eaten by a bear. And I will speak to you again soon. But for now, it's time to say goodbye. Bye, 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 bye.